a portion that talks about um, uh, right-wing religion in this country. And Frank is going to introduce that. Okay. Uh, Peter McLaren is a professor of education and critical studies at Chapman University here in Southern California. He is the author of many books on the topic of critical pedag pedagogy and revolutionary politics, including the recent critical pe pedagogy and insurrection. Um, Peter, are you there? I'm there, yeah, can you hear me? All right. Okay. All right, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to Frank and Rachel and to Code Pink and everyone who made uh, this really a, a amazing and important event uh, possible. I'm gonna be speaking um, primarily about liberation theology, uh, its birth and the, the historical assault on liberation theology. Recognizing the historical alliances that the church had made with colonial powers and empires of pillage and plunder, Pope John Paul the 23rd through the 1962, actually to 65, Second Vatican, Second Vatican Council attempted to reclaim the early roots of the church, the church of the first 300 years before it was recognized by its critics as the persecuting church that had among other things infamously ignited the crusades and the Spanish inquisition and was complicit in helping Nazis escape to Latin America after World War II. The Conference of Latin American Bishops that was held in 1968 in Medellin, Colombia, marked the beginning of a seismic shift within the Catholic Church as it began to arc somewhat towards the left. And it was here that bishops from all over Latin America agreed that the church should take a specific stand, which, which they called a preferential option for the poor, while developing a catechism of liberation undergirded by the gospel teachings of Jesus so that the poor could in effect liberate themselves from the institutionalized violence of, po of poverty and capitalist exploitation. And the philosophy that underlay liberation theology, one that combined Christianity with a Marxist critique of political economy, had been drawn up at a meeting of Latin American theologians initiated by Gustavo Gutierrez in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1964. Archbishop Helder Camara, who was famous for stating, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint, but when I ask why they are poor, they call me a communist. He led 40 bishops late at night into the catacombs of Domatilia outside of Rome. And after celebrating the Eucharist, they signed a document under the title, the Pact of the Catacombs, challenging themselves and others to live lives of poverty and to dedicate themselves to serving the two thirds of humanity who live in poverty. So liberation theology became a powerful movement for social justice within, within the Catholic church throughout the 1970s and 1980s in brushing against the grain of traditional Catholic catechesis. For decades, the Catholic church had been extremely adverse to social justice movements involving members of its ecclesiastical ranks, often associating such movements with communism. And this was made clear as early as the anti-communist encyclical, Divinae Redemptoris, written by Pope Pius XI in 1937, that formalized the Vatican's inevitable opposition against left-wing social movements, such as Dorothy Day's famous Catholic worker movement. Now, ironically, uh, today, uh, Dorothy Day has been named a servant of God by the Vatican and seems destined for sainthood. Um, so the persecution of priests who supported liberation theology became rampant in countries such as Brazil, Chile, El Salvador, Guatemala, Colombia, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Uh, storied educator Paulo Freire, a Catholic, was thrown into prison in June 1964 for his support of teaching campesino communities through the uh, practice of what came to be known as a pedagogy of the oppressed. Father Ernesto Cardenal, the Nicaraguan priest and poet who became the Sandinista minister of culture, famously remarked, for me, the four gospels are all equally communist. I'm a Marxist who believes in God, follows Christ, and is a revolutionary for the sake of his kingdom. It was interesting because I once sat beside Father Cardinal uh, on Hugo Chavez's TV show, Allo Presidente in Caracas, which what an amazing experience that was, uh, but that's for another time. 
Liberation theology gained international attention, attention after the government assassination of six Jesuit scholars, their housekeeper and their daughter on the 16th of November, 1989 on the campus of the Centro Americana University in, El, in San Salvador, El Salvador. These Jesuit priests were shot dead by soldiers because they had pushed for negotiations between the government and left-wing radicals. And prior to these horrific murders, which you know, made international headlines, the now canonized Archbishop Oscar Romero had been assassinated in 1980 while offering mass in the chapel of the Hospital of Divine Providence after famously speaking out against poverty, social injustice and torture and urging President Jimmy Carter to stop sending helicopter gunships to assist the Salvadorian military. Pope John Paul II was very much opposed to communism, obviously, and he considered liberation theology a dangerous development within the church. In the late 1970s, shortly after he was elected Pope, he began to oppose liberation theology directly and the church hierarchy moved decidedly to the right. It's been written that he gave cameo public endorsements for military dictatorships during visits to Argentina in 1982 and Chile in 1987. Okay. Early in the history of liberation theology, one of its most virulent opponents in North America, of course, was Ronald Reagan, who was intent on its utter destruction. As Noam Chomsky explains, and I quote, the United States, not content to sit back and watch an openly Marxist theology take hold in Latin America, a theology which threatened the US's economic and military do domination of the region, quickly moved to wipe out this emerging movement through violence. It did this through its strategic and logistical support of military dictatorships and its training of their death squads in the School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia. As early as 1969, the Rockefeller Report identified liberation theology as a threat to the corporate interests and the security of the United States. Following this, the clandestine Operation Condor was put in place. Operation Condor was a major plan of inter-service and regional cooperation and a sharing of joint intelligence among the US and the right-wing dictatorships of the Southern Cone of South America, including Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, Bolivia, and Brazil in order to maintain an intelligence sharing program of state terror and political repression. Well, the program actually began in 1968, but was fully implemented by 1975 and was responsible for as many or more than 60,000 deaths up until 1989. In Argentina alone, over 150 priests and nuns were killed along with peasants, workers, intellectuals, and anyone associated with being part of or sympathetic towards leftist guerrilla movements or liberation theology. The program, which can be traced to the infamous School of the Americas, of course, renamed the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation because of its historical association with the training of Latin American death squads, was created to advance joint counterinsurgency operations designed to eradicate communist subversives and ideas to suppress the influence of liberation theology and other oppositional political and or ideological positions. Through the Central Intelligence Aid Agency, the military and the State Department, the US government helped to bring military dictatorships to power and secure their stability by imposing sanctions designed to destabilize the economies of socialist leaning regimes and by supporting and training, quote, black op and execution squads. While the USA was not an official member of the Condor Consortium, documents that were later uncovered revealed that during this time, the United States provided major organizational, financial, and technical assistance to the repressive regimes involved. The secret papers of the 17th Conference of the American Armies in Mar del Plata in 1987 revealed that the US military initiated numerous discussions about how to wage socio-psychological warfare against liberation theology, ecclesi ecclesial and base communities through low intensity conflict strategies using misinformation and ideological subversion. So I agree with Norm Chomsky, who says that the US has often been bitterly opposed to Christianity and describes the attacks on liberation theology by the US administration as, quote, the first religious war of the 21st century. And then to conclude, after the election of Reagan, the Christian right became a dominant force in the Republican Party, of course, and in American politics in general, is Jerry Falwell, and Christian leaders supported the, the, evangelistic, uh, the evangelization of, of, of Latin America. 
Uh, basically, uh, Falwell said, I want you guys to get involved in politics and do missionary work in Latin America to counter left-wing Catholic teachers. That was one of a number of their, their goals. And during the 1980s, we see an amplification, of course, of anti-communism in the organizations, such as the Moral Majority, the Religious Roundtable, Focus on the Family, Free Congress Foundation, the Heritage Foundation, and the Christian Broadcasting Network. Thank you. They, thank you, Peter, for that very, very important um, testimony. It will be definitely put into the record. And I want to just say thank you, uh, Peter, for for calling out or sounding out um, Gustavo Gutierrez. I was a university student in Peru at La Católica in the late 80s, and he was a professor there, and it was, everyone knew it was very special, so uh, everyone knew him, so thank you, uh, Presente. Um, I want to just alert everyone, I think pretty soon in the chat, you're going to be getting the agenda again, but if you want to, if you care, if you're just sitting back and watching, great, but I just want to let you know a couple of changes that'll shorten the program on, on this page. Um, one, uh, Reverend Steve Wilson, uh, he's my minister from Unitarian Pacific Unitarian Church, um, wonderful minister. He has foregone his testimony. He's going to put it into the record. Uh, lots of UUs out there um, all these years being uh, persecuted. Uh, we are uh, going to have uh, Gail Walker up next, but before I introduce uh, her, we are also going to move um, John and I told you in the chat and we're his wonderful. So John Hankey not only filmed a testimony, he's made sort of a mini movie. So it's fabulous and, and you want to see it because he goes into the kind of deep, um, I want to say spiritual and ethical uh, reasons for all of this. It's quite good. Um, Jerry Condon, uh, one of our Vets for Peace, um, has is going to submit his testimony into the record. Um, and then the youth voices will be up after um, Gail uh, Walker. <laughs> 